Um, well, hello, everybody um, from London, um, where it is morning. Um, I know it's afternoon or even evening where some of you are. Uh, welcome to this DDEX webinar, um, which today is focusing on the standards that come under the heading of recording data and rights. Um, there will be uh, three of us speaking, all from the DDEX Secretariat. Um, today, myself, Mark Isherwood, I'll provide an overview of um, DDEX. Uh, I'm sure most of you are aware what DDEX is and what it does, but just in case. And then I'll talk about these particular sets of standards in the context of um, a couple of industry projects uh, only one is mentioned in the highlights there, RDX, but I'll also talk briefly about VRDB and the importance that the RDR standards play as part of the, the communication uh, element of, of those industry projects. Um, uh, Niels Rump, my colleague, will then look at, give an overview of all of the RDR standards and then go into some detail about the RDR revenue uh, standard or reporting standard. Uh, he'll explain uh, that in uh, as part of his um, uh, participation. And then uh, last but last not least, Vanessa Bastian will go into the um, detail of the other main uh, RDR standard, uh, the notification standard. Um, as always with uh, these webinars, um, we do welcome questions. If you could put those into the chat, we will try and pick those up as we go along. Uh, and obviously we will allow a bit of time towards the end of our, of our session to, to ask any uh, final questions before we finish. So um, moving on to the sort of um, the background or overview of DDEX, um, most of you probably know us as a, a standards development organization, um, principally operating in the music industry. Uh, and indeed, um, that is what we do. But the people are less aware that there are, in fact, three areas of, of standardization that we work on. The, the most common is devising the formats for uh, messages that companies exchange, computer messages that companies exchange between each other. And each of those formats is structured, the data is structured in a particular order, um, the data will may also have relationships with each other, and all of these are set down and standardized so that when um, a receiver of a message um, obviously receives the message, they know what it is that they have received and, and how they should interpret the data um, into their own systems. So those are the formats. We also standardize the what we call the choreographies, and these are um, the trigger points that might um, prompt uh, somebody to send a message to a business partner, uh, the order in which the messages are sent, uh, and just project generally brings order to what might be a multiple communication um, over a particular type of business transaction. And then finally, um, we devise the protocols these are the mechanisms by which the messages are actually exchanged, how they are actually exchanged on a day-to-day -day basis. Up until the last three or four years, perhaps, most of that exchange has been done using secure uh, FTP sites, um, where the standardization is relatively lightweight, things like uh, directory structures, standard um, um, uh, file naming conventions, and, and so on. But increasingly, DDEX is standardizing web service communication, which is much more automated um, and obviously allows computers to get on with the job where in the past perhaps uh, more humans were, were required. Um, we are now into quite a, a number of um, families of standards. Um, the main tube map there uh, shows you the principal uh, types of organizations that exist in the um, in the industry um, and um, show the different types of transactions um, that each of them are doing. Um, and for each of those, 
there is a separate standard. Now, that might suggest that all of the standards are different. That is far from the case. They all use the same sorts of building blocks. Um, they may have the data in a different order, but they, they are, there's a lot of commonality within and across all of the standards. Um, and um, there are one or two that sort of don't fit neatly into the diagram. Um, many of you will be aware um, in the US of the Mechanical Licensing Collective, um, which is uh, went live uh, on the 1st of January. Um, uh, and that has responsibility for managing mechanical licenses of musical works for certain types of DSPs in the US. Uh, and DDEX was asked to create, um, well, in fact, two standards for them. One is a bulk feed of their database, which is a requirement that they have to do under the legislation that created the organization. And then we created a special profile uh, for sales and usage reporting. What we're concentrating on today is the communication between record companies, what are called music licensing companies. Those are companies that administer collectively uh, rights in um, record company rights and performer rights. And it's the communication between the record companies who have the mainly the repertoire data and amongst the different music licensing companies around the world. Um, DDEX has a number of these as members, which you will see later. And also, as I have mentioned, uh, a couple of industry projects that exist within this, this area of, of rights administration, RDX and VRDB2 and the communication with it. Um, one of the things that, uh, that really does underpin DDEX is its data dictionary. Um, and sometimes people talk about DDEX being a language or a translator. Uh, and it's certainly in computer terms, the lingua franca of the industry these days. Um, and if you think that two companies, company A and company B, each have their own data models that drive their own systems. Um, and what DDEX does is allow them to talk to each other and know exactly what it is um, in terms of the, the information they're exchanging. Um, so although company B may, may call uh, a recording something else in their database, um, they know by using the DDEX as a, as a translator that that's what they're being told by company A. Um, so the data dictionary is the sort of beating heart of, of DDEX and contains all of the terms that appear in all of the different messages and the structure of, of the common, what we call composites. And as I mentioned earlier on, there are common building blocks uh, within DDEX. And so uh, certain uh, 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 entities that are very common, you know, musical work, sound recordings, parties, uh, and so on, um, these will all be struck, the, the data that's needed to describe a sound recording or a party or a, or a musical work are structured in a composite, um, both in terms of order and in terms of relationships between the different data elements that describe that entity. And you will find that these exist um, throughout all of the standards and are very much the building blocks upon uh, which the standards are developed. Even when we're beginning with an absolutely brand new standard, uh, as we did a few years ago with the um, media enrichment and description standard, uh, Mead, brand new standard never we'd never started basically with a blank sheet of paper um but we did use these building blocks to actually create the 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 standard in the end even though other structures had to be included uh, in order to meet that particular business transaction requirement so in terms of um you know how far ddex has spread across the world we've in in we have issued uh, implementation licenses in excess of 6,500. Um, sadly, DDEX has fairly limited information about what actual implementations are going on. But clearly, with that number taking out implementation licenses, there isn't really a company that's serious about this industry that is uh, not using DDEX. So uh, as I've said, our, um, our focus today 
is the RDR standards, um, which is communication primarily between record companies, music licensing companies, and amongst themselves in different countries. And uh, quite importantly, with these two particular projects that exist within um, within the administration of producer and by which I mean record company, uh, producer and performer uh, rights. Um, and these are a sort of centralized projects intended to improve the quality of data uh, and therefore improve efficiency and the ability for these collective rights organizations to get the money to the right person or company. So just one uh, note, uh, I've already mentioned to you the Mechanical Licensing Collective, which obviously has the acronym MLC. Um, the standards that we're talking about today uh, used to be called within DDEX the Music Licensing Company Standards, uh, obviously another MLC. So um, uh, last year, about this time last year, to avoid ongoing confusion, of which there was quite a lot, we have changed the name of these standards. Um, there is still a transition of this naming um, change going on um, because the current version of um, the RDR, what is now RDR N, is actually has an actually is called MLC 1.4, um, but 1.5 is due to be published shortly, and that will be called RDR. So unfortunately, there is. This slight confusion, not of our making, but we're we're trying to um, uh, resolve it um, over time. Um, as I mentioned, there are a number of um, MLCs that are members of DDEX, and and those are the ones up there that you can see. Um, and uh, the the original sort of purpose for the standards as we know them was primarily for communication amongst the MLCs themselves, but increasingly the record companies and performer organizations are taking a, a serious interest in, in making sure that the data that the MLCs use is of high quality. And so uh, as well as the, the MLCs being members, obviously we have record companies uh, and they are very much part of the development of these standards. So um, uh, before we sort of move into the, the standards themselves, um, I just want to provide a little bit of background to the two industry projects that I've mentioned that rely very heavily on the RDR, um, in this case, RDRN standard, the notification standard. The first of these is called RDX. Um, it was a project originally created by WIN, which is the World Independent Network, and IFPI, so obviously uh, record company uh, organizations, and was operate and is operated by PPL, which is the MLC in the UK. Um, and like a lot of these projects, it's about improving and increasing access to reliable and authoritative repertoire information. Um, to, uh, to aid accurate, efficient, and timely distribution. And the way in which the, the RDR uh, works is that um, data sources, primarily record companies, submit data to RDX, um, and they look at uh, and try and identify uh, conflicts, conflicts and get them resolved. The MLCs as recipients of this data can subscribe to receive the, the repertoire data um, and also then send back uh, status updates as to how the recordings and the, the repertoire data is being represented in their local systems. Um, as a consequence, RDX can then pass that data or that information through to the record company. So you're creating a sort of uh, virtuous circle um, um, that enables the quality of the data about the repertoire um, to, to gradually increase. Uh, and each of those steps is represented by a different uh, message, um, which appears within the RDRN uh, standard. Um, and these will be talked about in a little bit more detail uh, as we go through the webinar. The second project to talk about is the VRDB. 
Um, again, it's a centralized system to identify recordings and works, but the focus is more on ensuring that there is um, accurate performer information so that the individual um, MLCs that are managing performer royalties are able to run distributions effectively. And like a lot of these projects, the types of benefits are, are what you would expect. It reduces a lot of workload. Um, there's more standardization, which obviously re improves efficiency and reduces cost. Um, most particularly from a DDEX point of view, there's a common communication format. So again, the um, RDR standards are used. Um, increased transparency, all, all the, the usual things that you would see um, for a project like this. Um, and the way in which the concepts in which they uh, are applying here um, in order to do that is uh, there's a common means of clustering recordings data which they, they get, which may appear to be duplicates. Um, and obviously, as it's all stored in one place, it allows the um, any um, duplicates or, or conflicts to be resolved um, at, to ultimately land up at a single version of a recording or work and the associated performer data, which is the critical uh, part of this particular project. Um, and obviously, um, a lot of standardizations in terms of timing and synchronization of processes. So um, that's a brief introduction to those two projects and to DDEX. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Niels, um, who will uh, take the reins going forward, I believe, uh, if I can give you the reins. Uh, keyboard and mouse should now be with you, uh, Niels. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I hope um, you can all hear me. Um, and can I just repeat what Mark has said at the very, very beginning? If you have any question or any uh, any suggestion to make, please um, do type it into the into the chat, um, and one of us will pick that up, um, and then we can um, we can address that. So, um, as Mark has said, we currently have one standard which we call the MLC standard, which is soon to be the RDR standard, um, which contains um, three different aspects. And those three dis different aspects have now been separated into three different bits. The first of those is the radar notification, RDR notification. That is to enable a record company to making to make claims for rights in the sound recording or, or a music video to a music licensing company, but also um, to, to address claims um, or mandates for performer um, rights. The same message can and is being sent between music licensing companies. So um, it's kind of a daisy chaining. The record company sends it to one music licensing company and it's then being forwarded on to the, what sometimes calls the sister society, um, to a music licensing company in another country to represent the original rights holder in that territory and to collect revenues and then pass it back. The second bit is, sorry, problems with my controls. The second bit is the revenue reporting. So. As I said, first you have the notification. Here is a sound recording. Here are the performers. Can you please represent these rights for me, for the performer? And then there is the reporting back from one music licensing company to another music licensing company and from a music licensing company to the ultimate rights holder. Um, so it's kind of the inverse. Now, as Mark has said at the beginning, we're dealing with the format of the messages, but also with the actual choreography, who sends what to whom, and how is the information exchanged using web services, using FTP, and those kind of things. And that is the third standard, the RDR choreography. So we have RDRN, RDRR, and RDRC, or 
actually how I should pronounce it, radar N, radar R, and radar C. And as I said, these are currently in the version 1.4 of the standard that Mark has mentioned, um, one piece of um, one standard. It's all in one, but we have since split it into three. Radar C and Radar R have been published already in um, about well, a month or two months ago, and Radar N will be published later today. So once I get off this call, I will actually get on with publishing that standard. It has been approved, everything is done, it just needs uh, putting up on the website. So starting from later today, your tomorrow morning for some of you, this will be the, the MLC standard will be basically history. The choreography and the message exchange mechanism that is used for all of those um, radar messages, whether it's radar N or radar uh, N or R, <laughs> they are all communicated using FTP. In the record company to DSP world, increasingly the use of web services is being being used. I personally think that at some stage the same may happen for for the communication between record companies and music licensing companies and amongst music licensing companies. But for the time being, the communication of those files is FTP. Um, and the structure of the data is either XML for the for the information about the rights about the sound recording because it is essentially hierarchical information. You have a sound recording; it's used on a on a host sound carrier on a product. Uh, you have the, the individual uh, parties that have uh, contributed to the sound recordings, the artists. All of that is hierarchical information. Whereas the usage report, the sales report, the revenue reporting. That is basically tabular data. Here's a product. It's been used five times in this territory for that use and so forth. So that's a table, which is why we using flat file, a flat file structure for that, which you can basically, if it's small enough, ingest into Excel. The current version, the MLC 1.4, um, even though it also has a reporting aspect to it that uses XML for everything. Um, but we found that that is actually just not an efficient use of, of computer resources. So version 1.5 is due to be published by the end of March. Well, that's actually, we were a little bit faster. It will be published today. And MLC 1.3 and MLC 1.4 is in use today. And um, well, there you see the dates for the for the other two standards. It's actually a bit longer than I thought. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the reporting stand. It's a little bit um, the other way around, um, but then I'll hand over to my colleague, Vanessa, who will then talk about the radar notification standard. Uh, standard. Um, the reporting standard, um, the choreography itself is comparatively, comparatively simple. You simply have a music licensing company that has generated some revenue, which can be um, can range from revenues directly attributable to a specific sound recording um, to information such as uh, private copy levying, levy and, and those kind of things. All of those revenues have been generated, have been um, tabulated in their internal systems, and they now want to communicate that information to either another music licensing company, if, for example, um, a Danish MLC has generated revenue, but the sound recording is owned and rights controlled by an English record company, then there needs to be a flow from the Danish to the British MLC, music licensing company, that can be done, or then the British MLC, PPL in that case, would send the information on to the record company itself. Um, as I said, the MLC standard currently or, or still has this revenue declaration message uh, in there, and we have kept it in the radar end standard for compatibility reasons. Over time, I would expect those messages to be taken out of there, but for the time being, in the version that will be published later today, 
we still have those messages in there. Um, Vanessa won't really talk about them because we really think that the flat file is the better approach for that. So that's what we're going to focus on for the reporting bit. Um, as I said, 1.4 is still XML, but we're not really talking about uh, tabular data. Now, we had exactly the same problem, if you like, a couple of years back uh, for the sales and usage reporting to music rights societies and music publishers, where DSPs had to provide humongous um, sales reports, XML formatted sales reports. There were about 80 gigabytes per month per um, DSP when it comes to especially streaming services. Um, so that, that was simply not sustainable. So we came up with a flat file um, solution, which now the Radar Working Group has adopted for the reporting standard, and that, that seems to work quite well. And we now have two reporting messages in that flat file standard. Both of those messages are what I would call rich TSV. TSV because it's a tabular a tabulator separated value file, so something that you can just ingest into Excel if the file is small enough. But at the same time, it's rich in the sense that not all the lines are the same. You have different record types describing different bits. And in the, in the case of the radar standard, um, you have a header and a footer. The header tells you who sent the message to whom, when was it sent, and those kind of administrative information, similar with a footer, which basically just tells you how many lines are in that report. Um, then you have some kind of a revenue record that gives you uh, information about um, how much revenue is allocated to each producer. And then you have the main body, which you then which then contains the individual lines for the individual. Um, sound recordings for which claims have been made using the radar and standard, typically. Um, and, and, and one of the things that hasn't been done yet, but can certainly be done, is to create additional records in, in order for to cater for specifically for performer needs. If that is needs to happen, we can certainly do that. That there's not a problem. The structure is flexible enough to to deal with that. So this is how it looks like. You have the header. They all start with a four letter acronym, R-H-E-A in this case. So it's the radar header and the radar footer at the end. And so the first line always tells you what's the record type. And then you have cells after cells after cells with the actual data. You then have those statement summaries, potentially with the summary for each of those allocated uh, party so who actually gets the, the summary overall this much money has been generated and is being distributed and this is for that party this is for that party this is for that party and then you have the body which then are the details for the sound recordings for the music videos or for any other kind of uh, revenue that has been generated such as um, levies and those kind of things so it's fairly straightforward um, what makes it slightly tricky is that you need to have a little bit of pointing between each of those because all of the allocated party summary records, for example, they summarize specific detailed records, those for which they have provided um, claims early on. And that needs there needs to be some pointing between those record types or those different records, which means that each of those lines in there has its own local identifier which also helps greatly to identify um, if there are any errors or any issues with that. You can actually talk about it. Hey, I sent you a report. It's line, the line with the identifier 566. Can we just talk about that? So that's quite, quite a handy way of debugging any issues that there may be. Um, Together with the choreography standard, which, as I said, uses FTP and has a very simple file naming convention, it's a, it's a very bare bones, um, simple standard, fit for purpose, but simple. Um, Radar R was published in October. We know that the first implementations are taking place or have taken place, and we, we are increasingly 
publishing knowledge base articles explaining the interactions between those uh, collecting uh, between the different types of music licensing companies collecting ones paying ones and claiming ones which is uh, sometimes quite um, critical and, and tricky to understand who plays what role and how do they need to be communicated in in the message um, and we're starting to collect some change requests the current version is version 1.0 and we would expect some some teething issues with that um, so we, there will be change requests um, on the agenda of the working group in the in during the course of this and next year and then we'll we'll most likely publish an, an updated version i can't see that be greatly different but there will be some small changes no doubt um that's my bit my spiel if there are any questions before i hand over to vanessa then please feel free to uh, to to speak up or, or type up. Um, but if you have a question while Vanessa speaks about radar R, please do um, to type nevertheless and we'll try to answer. Vanessa, I think you have now control. First of all, welcome. And I will now try to summarize what radar N uh, is all about. Niels and Mark have provided a really good summary about it and now as you can see on the left side of the screen you have the choreography of how the information actually flows and in this particular case for the notification of all the resource based information you have the record companies sending data to the music licensing companies and music licensing sharing uh, information between each other we have got several messages in this uh, suite of standard, and uh, the first and most used one is the declaration of sound recording rights claim message for declaring the claims and the mandates. Equally, there is a message to call the revoke sound recording rights claim message for revoking such claims. Then there is the request sound recordings right claim message for requesting the claims and the right claim status update message to pay back and the received claims. So this particular suite of messages allows you to claim your interest, to revoke and to request it. It uh, has got six clauses and of which you still have the choreography outlined between the different parties communicating with each other and obviously the message content, which is in XML. So I'm trying to move. Yes, here we are. Apologies, I seem to be, there we are. You went the wrong way, but I've moved it on for you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mark. Um, the radar N message has got um, three new messages that we have included with the new version that is coming out later today. Those are the assertion of collection mandate message for declaring performer mandates, the revoke collection mandate message, and the assertion of collection mandate status update message. All, um, all those um, are important in order to make sure that we can uh, use with with the scenarios where there are mandates and people rights rights um, rights owners providing the mandate and therefore giving the authority to do the collection on behalf of the record companies or other music licensing companies. Mark, I seem to be unable to move the slides. Thank you. So the structure of the radar N, as Mark and Niels mentioned before, is structured based on most of the DDEG standards. And you have got the header. And most importantly, for this particular message, all the information that goes into the resource list. And the radar standard, the radar end standard is a resource rather than release based. So sound recording 
versus album based in this particular instance as an example. And every time there is an update for that particular sound recording or resource, a new message is being sent. The data is quite um, vast, but none of them are mandatory. You can see here on the right the possibility of providing information from one party to another. Any possible information that is related to a resource can be provided here on the right. Um, but don't fear, not all of this is mandatory. And in the assertion of collection message, you can see it's, it's just based on the message header and the collection mandate. And on the collection mandate, you've got, um, again, two composites within that um, that allow you to provide the necessary information. There, the collection mandate assigner and the assigned collection mandate. And those structures um, we are currently um, working on to probably after the first live implementations are occurring, we will be we will be working on aligning this particular structure more towards other standards that currently exist within the DDEX family of standards, uh, in particular the ERN and the RIN. So, as I mentioned, the standard provides the possibility to provide as much and detailed information for each and every resource, but not all tags are mandatory. DDEX has provided two profiles. One is the core data profile and the second one is the re recommended profile. Because there is so much data to provide, it is um, important, however, that a minimum here sufficient data is provided for many music licensing companies to register a recording and then similarly the recommended profile provides the possibility and clearly states what is the data that is sufficient for those music licensing companies to allocate revenue when recording is used and to pay out within the distribution um, of course, these are only core and recommended profile data that allows the message to not to fail. And there are territory specific or bilateral contractual agreements that um, are outside of those core data profiles and need to be agreed between the two parties exchanging the information. Currently, um, as Niels stated, Radar N 1.5 is the successor of MLC 1.4. It should be um, declared a DDEX standard um, later today. We have um, updated, not only have we taken out um, or tried to change the structure when removed uh, the Radar R and Radar C element of the MLC 1.4, but we have significantly enhanced the communication. What we have done is uh, to enhance the right claims in sound recordings and music videos. And up, as I mentioned before, we included three new uh, messages for the coll collection mandates granted to the music licensing companies by the record companies. Um, Although it maintains the overall structure of MLC 1.4 at the moment, the aim is to move to Radar 2.0, where we will completely rework the structure in order to align it with ERN and BRIT. Just to outline a few of the changes that have been made, between MLC 1.4 and 1.5 here's a, just a brief summary of the main um, improvements. We again three new messages relating to collection mandates have been added. We um, added the support for local agreements where a session musician union asserts right claims. We now are able to support library music 
um, or what we often call production music. And as part of this, we updated the original purpose composite and introduced commercial availability flag. Furthermore, um, the host sound carrier composite is a composite in radar N that tries to make the link between the resource and the host sound carrier that, that resource is being sold on. One of the use cases is that a resource is sold on a compilation and the compilation is in a way different from another host sound carrier such as an album because the rights owners on a compilation on resource level can all be different. And that is information that the music licensing company obviously needs to know in order to make sure that the correct rights owners are being remunerated at the end of the day. So that is something that Radar N now accommodates and it is much easier to report compilations specifically for private copy levy. We also included uh, is remastered black flag in a sound recording and video composite. This is a, a slight alignment to how the ERN is already coping with remastered sound recordings. A minor structural change has been done by moving the rights controller one level up which should make it easier to report the rights of resources. If I can just jump on that last point, because there's something that actually is currently going on in the ERN working group, which also will impact the radar working group, and which will then be hopefully useful to the users of both the ERN and the radar standard is that we're currently collecting a number of use cases for how to how to populate the the um, rights controller composite. So you have cases like there's an independent record company that sends information onto a DSP and a music licensing company. How should that look in a rights controller composite? How does it look like if that is a, um, a label within a larger label group? What happens if the content has been sub-licensed for a specific territory and then sent on by a different uh, label um, group, by a major label, or those kind of things? So we have a list of, correct me, Vanessa, 20 uh, use cases, something like that, that we need to um, provide uh, examples for, and then we will provide guidance on how that can be used. Because apparently, different companies use the um, um, rights controller composite in different ways which is clearly not a good thing for a standard um so keep I'll, I'll, we'll keep you all um posted through the knowledge base when the these use cases and the samples how to express those use cases using the rights controller composite will come out sorry Vanessa. Hey. No, thank you, Niels. That is that is correct. I, I think uh, terminology is important. You know, rights controller, rights owner, um, mandated rights controller. There are so many different terminology, and um, it's open. It, it shouldn't be open to interpretation. So Niels is right. We we are trying to put all possible scenarios together between um, who can send whom set information between record companies, DSPs, and music licensing companies. So um, currently, the working group is um, working on completing the implementation documentation on the knowledge base for the radar R that is being um, well, currently, since October, and the first live Im implementation are taking place, and the first feedbacks are being provided so that we can see uh, when one version 1.1 needs to be um, worked on. We are very keen 
to now move away from MLC 1.4 and move to the new radar standards. And DDEX is currently working on uh, organizing hosting implementation events and workshops, in particular to uh, first to members and then non-members in order to increase the knowledge on um, working with the new standards. The third point here on screen um, reiterates the point that we need to work on an updated version of Radar R. And as mentioned before, the next very big step will be to align RDRN with ERN and RIN, which is sometime in the future as we are just announced Radar N as, or will announce Radar N as a standard later today. Thank you, uh, Vanessa. Um, there is one question um, that's been raised in the chat, which we can deal with now. Um, the question is, is the RDRN structure uh, also possible to include musical works and IDs like ISWCs? Um, the, the answer to that, uh, Jörg, is, is no. The RDR standards are specifically focused on the administration of sound recordings and performers' rights. Um, there are obviously other standards that focus on um, um, musical works. Um, so, for example, and those are not all DDEX standards. So, for example, um, for the registration of musical works to, to their rights societies, uh, most publishers will use the CWR uh, standard, which is which is not a DDEX standard, but a, C, a CSAC one. A CSAC one. Um, but obviously, for sales information, um, there are the DSR DDEX DSR standards, um, which are intended to manage the administration of musical works. In that particular case, um, sales and usage reporting from DSPs um, to usually musical work, uh, collective rights organizations, and occasionally uh, publishers. So that, that helps with that. May I just um, slightly correct, Mark, because actually I just checked, it is actually, there is a musical work ID composite in the uh, radar standard. What Mark has said about the use of the standard is completely correct. Um, I would not um, provide musical work um, to, to provide work information in the radar message because that's not what the message is meant for but it does contain um, the musical work ID composite so you can provide an ISWC but you can't provide um, well theoretically you can also provide provide writer information because they're contributors and therefore you can provide that as well but um, yeah it, it's in there as an aid to matching or uh, identifying so on that level it is there um but really the the follow-up um uh, question about uh, would it be possible to include the iswc as a custom identifier well as nils has said it's in there but that's not really the purpose of the standards the standards are very much focused on sound recording and performer rights um with regard to fingerprinting, um, primarily um, um, record companies use the ERN standard to provide data um, to fingerprinting companies along with the actual fingerprints um, um, rather than, than, than RDR. Um, well, certainly they don't use RDR for that purpose. It's very much for um, the purposes we've been talking about. Um, so just to finish off, um, we're coming to the end. Um, obviously, there is further information available on the DDEX um, knowledge base. Um, that's the home page of the knowledge base in its current format. The address is kb.ddex.net. Um, and if you go to the section implementing recording data and rights uh, standards. Um, you can click through um, there on, on the left uh, and on the left panel, uh, and that will take you through to, to more information um, that you can uh, read up on your in your own time. So uh, that concludes our webinar. 
Uh, obviously, if there are any other questions, we will do our very best to, to answer those and uh, give people a moment to, to write anything that they may have. Um, I would just remind you uh, in the meantime that um, this webinar is, is part of a series that uh, runs through until June. Uh, in a month or so, we'll start looking at putting together webinars for the second half of the year. Um, and um, you can go uh, to the events tab at the main DDEX uh, website, ddex.net, um, if you want to learn about what webinars are coming up. Um, and um, uh, uh, register through that page. There's another question here. There is one thing RDX is lacking at the moment, sales reports due to allocate blank tape levy. Any plans to standardize these? Well, there's, there's a number of issues there. Firstly, RDX is only intended to be a repertoire database. It's only intended to um, enable better identification of sound recording rights. Um, it's not um, involved in the actual process of um, the allocation of royalties to individual record companies. That's still done by the individual MLCs. Um, the RDRR standard is a mechanism whereby this community, the record companies and the, the MLCs, can share information about, uh, among other things, blank tape levy fees. Um, so that, that is part and parcel of this particular standard. Um, in terms of other types of reporting, say, for example, from radio uh, stations or from TV stations, most of that reporting yeah, uses proprietary standards or standards developed for a particular territory that are not within um, within the DDEX uh, governance. Um, so there are there are obviously a lot of other formats in play, um, but gradually the industry uh, across a number of different areas of transactions is moving towards uh, DDEX standards wherever possible. So I hope that helps uh, answer that. If I can um, just add one one thing to that, um, Jens, if there are any specific things that you are missing in the radar reporting standard for the communication of blank um, tape levies or, or or hard disk levies and those things, please do do let us know what is missing. Um, because as we've said, we are collecting information of what's missing at the moment, so that version 1.1. Uh, will be better. So um, this is very much an invitation to to let us know what is missing. Indeed. Okay. Um, well, I think we're we we've come to the end of uh, the session. We hope you found it helpful. Um, a recording of this will be available on the uh, resource and press tab on ddex.net uh, within a couple of days if you want to revisit this. Um, uh, there's another question coming from Jörg, but including available ISWC would enhance the matching possibility between the masters and the works, wouldn't it? Um, especially in the context of dealing with the MLC in the US. Uh, the, the thing, uh, in a way, Jörg, the answer to your question is yes. The, the issue is, though, that these standards and the work that the, the, the music licensing companies like PPL and SCPP in France and GVL in Germany are doing is not about matching musical works to sound recordings. Their job is to um, allocate royalties for the use of the sound recordings and the performers' rights. They are not overly or directly concerned about linking musical works to sound recordings. So although your your statement on the face of it makes sense, um, this community is not concerned directly with the linking of musical works to sound recordings. Um, and so it, it, that is something that has to be done primarily um, by the musical work collective organizations and is also done by private companies like Grace Note or 
Music Story or, or various other, other companies that provide uh, metadata of that kind. Okay, so um, that all said, uh, thank you for your attention. Um, and as I said, a recording of this will be available within a couple of days on the uh, resource and uh, press tab of ddex.net. So thank you all very much indeed, and um, hopefully we will see you again at a future webinar. Uh, thanks for now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.